Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Youth Matters and in today's show we are discussing the Muslim ban is this just the start and uh, already in the first two segments we had a lot of uh, views from our audience about how they feel about what's going on and our panel uh, have also contributed towards that discussion and in this last segment we are looking at how we move forward from this uh, to ensure uh, that we have a world in which we feel we can contribute towards how it is uh, dictated, how it is run and we are part of that process. So uh, if you're watching this at home and you've got an opinion on this please do get in touch either email us or phone us and uh, we will share your question with the panel and the audience okay um, before we go to our audience uh, we've got emails flooding in um, here it says uh, my point is about the upcoming state visit uh, don't you think that this is uh, by just banning him from visiting doesn't really solve the problem we can't deny that Trump is a person with huge influence now he should be invited and we should be able to at least inform and educate him to change his views so that's a really um, interesting question uh, is there anyone in our audience who would like to respond to that okay that's fine I'll go over to our panel um, Ibrahim I respect the view. I mean, uh, I can see where it's coming from. But ultimately, um, you need to, at a time like this, you need to send a very strong message and signal. And the UK is a very significant, influential player in the globe stage. It's not a, an irrelevant country, so to speak. So when, these, when voices like, or even concerns about him coming to a country are heard, that should make people, not necessarily Trump, but people in his inner circle say, you know what, hey, hang on a minute, you have five years here, right, or five, four years. There's no point upsetting all your neighbours and your allies. You've got to realise that you've got to bring it back a notch, you know. So ultimately, yes, you know, the, 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 the battle of ideas or the, you know, the, the marketplace of ideas, uh, you know, is, is important and, you should, and it should definitely be challenged. But rolling out the carpet, a state visit so mm -hmm. early on, I mean, it just sends a message like, we don't really care what you say about Muslims or about Mexicans, or about the disabled, or about women, as long as we get our trade deal and we get, you know, a good relationship with the states. That is not leadership. And if anything, that is capitulation. And to be, let's be very frank again, no other country, it doesn't, any other country, you know, and let's be, you know, UK has its country that necessarily has a, a, a beef with, you could say, you know, it might be Turkey, might be Saudi Arabia, might be Iran, North Korea, you know, but if, for example, Burma, right, for example, I mean, if there was an issue with these countries, the UK would jump at a chance of saying things. But when there are countries where there's a strategic interest, as they always say, or a national interest, it capitulates. So ultimately, your values only go so far. Sure. Thank you. Um, we had a question right at the back. We could pass the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question was to do with airport security that we had in the first segment. It was about how that teacher was not allowed into New York, despite of having a British passport and being born in this country. That could have been any one of us. Mm. That could be any one of us. I want to know, like, how do you deal with situations like that? Okay. Um, how do you how do you feel about how, how what was your reaction when that news broke i think if that was me i would feel really victimized because you would have everyone on the plane looking at you like you have done something wrong and mm. it would be pretty embarrassing as well i think sure okay um Arib, how would you you spoke about it in the first segment how you had uh, challenges at the airport yeah okay um i i think to, to answer your question um straight on i think the reason why um, the Welsh teacher story was so important and so prominent was that was because he wasn't afraid to speak up. And I think especially marginalised communities, especially the Muslim community, Bengali community and whatnot, um, our, our forefathers, like our mum and dad and whatnot, they would encourage us to not get involved in politics. They'd encourage us to not uh, speak out or do political subjects, uh, stick to like accounting, finance, law, etc. Because they're safe jobs. And it's understandable because they came at a time when there was intense racism, where they were victimised, where on the streets of um, Brick Lane, East London, you had like the National Front uh, literally um, shouting abuse, killing um, and, and um, uh, abusing uh, Bengalis on the street. So I'd say in terms of if that situation ever happened to you, my first advice, and this, is, this comes across a bit uh, uh, um, self-interest because I'm a journalist myself, is to speak up. Like, these incidences are not going to stop overnight. And the more kind of publicity is given to these inc incidences, the more kind of um, promotion is given, the more, the more kind of people wake up and realise, wow, this is happening. I'll give you a very good example. So last October, in my local mosque... Um, Harib, can I um, take a call and come back to your means. local mosque? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> All right. Um, Assalamu alaikum, caller. Uh, Welcome, Salaam. Uh, how would you like to contribute to the discussion? 
Uh, basically, I wanted to just say that the just to offer a bit of balance, really, to the debate. Um, I mean, I think the, the Muslim ban doesn't really affect us here in the UK, um, and that really and truly the ban has been lifted on some of the countries, hasn't it? Um, so it's a bit. So yeah, I just wanted to offer a bit of a balance, really. I think I think we're just talking and going around in circles a little bit, mm. and I think that the youth as well are offering similar sort of questions. Mm. So I think they need to talk more about, you know, the other countries involved that could do something maybe perhaps to, to you know, to do something about it, I suppose. Sure. What's your view on uh, Trump visiting the UK, Donald Trump visiting the UK? I mean, he's well within his rights to visit the UK, isn't he? I mean, he's, you know, leader of the most powerful country in the world. I mean, England and America have a long-standing relationship. So, yeah, what's wrong with it? What's your view on the on the Muslim ban in America? It's not right. Obviously, the Muslim ban is a right, but at the same time, it's just Donald Trump, I think, just trying to do bits for a bit of publicity. So that's just his way of doing things, I suppose. But everything he said that he's going to do, he's, he's tried to do, and he's kind of gone back on in a way. Sure. OK, thank you for sharing your views. Uh, OK, um, Arib, you... Um to answer that yeah, question. if you can answer that question. Um, I, I think to answer the caller's, um, in, to respond to the caller's mm. question and comments, I'd, I'd say, number one, um, to a certain degree he's correct in the sense that there has been a temporary pause on the executive order because cause a federal court ruled that uh, the uh, the ban wasn't right. I don't I don't want to say unconstitutional because I don't think that was, that was the exact word. But at the same time, even despite that temporary pause taking place in um, America, I'd, I'd say that the ramifications of it, the impact of it is still happening right now in terms of individuals who, who are dual nationals, who are, who are either born in Yemen or, have, or, or um, have a Yemeni passport or a passport from these other countries, they are being affected. I mean, like, like, I was, like the question I was talking about, the panelists, not panelists, sorry, the audience member was talking about a few moments ago, um, it's already having an effect. You're seeing um, Muslims being um, stopped from going to America. So I would say I would say I think um, with all due respect to the call, I think it's a bit naive to assume that the, um, the the ramifications of the Muslim ban hasn't come into play because it already has, and mm. the evidence is there in terms of people being prevented sure. from going on flights. And the caller spoke about uh, one of the countries having that lifted. Is that? Um, I think what, what the caller was referring to, I might be wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm, the caller could be more than happy to come in and chime in. Um, to correct me if needs to be. But from my understanding of it, a federal court in America has actually um, um, temporarily paused the uh, the ban at this moment in time. So you're seeing yeah. individuals from those seven Muslim majority countries. That's probably what the court but, was referring to, yeah. But at the same time, Donald Trump, only a few days ago, there was reports of him Rescind, mm. bringing that back in, but instead of, but what he'll, he'll they'll refine the language a bit, sure. i.e., take out the word Muslim okay. so it doesn't come across as a Muslim ban, and also allow individuals who've got green cards to be allowed in. So even though there is a temporary pause, there are still efforts going on behind the scenes right now to mm. ban individuals from those seven Muslim majority countries to be allowed into the That's UK. That's fine. Um, we had a question so from uh, Shakib. Yeah, can we get the uh, microphone, please? Do you think similar policies will be implemented in the UK? OK. Uh, Elaine? I don't think so. I, I hope not, actually, is the, is the real answer. Um, I think there is a danger that um, because he's been invited on this state visit and because what he's saying is being uh, legitimised by that, that there will be people in Parliament and people in this country who believe in the same things as him who will then start saying, well, actually, we should have the same thing here and look, America's done it, why can't we? I think we have a good enough system in this country that actually it won't happen. But I worry less about things like the out-and-out and out-and-out and out ban coming in because I don't think that would happen here. It's more the, it's the smaller things, it's the rise in Islamophobia and Islamophobic attacks that have happened since the ban came in. Um, it's all of the, the cultural change that then happens, it's the, it's the fact that communities then turn around and stop trying to seek to understand um, diversity in their own communities and just kind of go, oh actually we're not, we're just going to carve ourselves off from this group of people. Mm. It legitimises all of that and that's actually in some ways more dangerous because it becomes so insipid and so ingrained rather than an out-and-out -out ban that you, you can fight against. Sure. Shakib, do you worry that 
you know, this might uh, occur on our shores. Um, well, I don't think it will happen here, but I think if... Why do you think it won't happen here? Because, I mean, people get emotional, and that's what Donald Trump is doing. He's playing on emotions, but I think because in the UK we don't really have stuff like that. I mean, we have the UK, but they're not that extreme, and they won't actually come out and say, oh, we think this and this of Muslims or any other group of people. But I think that the fact that Trump can do it, it might influence some other people and think that maybe, yeah, we could do this and we could go out and actually say what we want to say. But I don't think it will happen in the UK. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Nida, if you want to ask your, your third question. Um, just that is there any possibility of calling this ban anything else other than a Muslim ban? Um, do you want to explain that a bit As more? in, I think some there is still some debate on whether this is a Muslim ban or if it's just, it just so happens to be that seven countries of Muslim majorities are banned. I think there was a debate in the beginning. Sure. Um, what's, your, that. what's your view on that? I think it's a direct attack, attack on um, the community and I definitely think it's a Muslim ban. I think it would be misinformed to take it any, any other way. Mm. Okay. Uh, Ibrahim. So even if, uh, going back to what Arib was saying, even if uh, the word Muslim is taken out of that, is it still, I guess your question is, is it still directing it towards Muslims uh, around the world? Well, of course it is. I mean, if you actually look at these countries, for example, there was a lot of talk in the early days saying that, oh, but what about the Syrian Christ Christians, the Christians that live in Iraq and so on, or the Assyrians or the mi Jewish minorities or, what, what, or the you know, Zoroastrians in Iran? And they'll say, well, no, 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 we're not interested in those people. Uh, they will be allowed in, especially the Christian Syrian refugees. But of course, the Muslims, we you know, we've got to uh, take into account that there is radicalism. And I think this is the problem. There's, this bit, there's been this like, acceptance in some circles that, that there's a synonymous understanding that Muslims just happen to have a switch in their head and get angry and do things. Um, but in terms of these countries, actually, let's look at these countries in comparison to other Muslim countries. I mean, they happen to be one of the most educated, most literate uh, Muslim countries in, in the Muslim world. I mean, if you go to many Muslim countries, they're very renowned. You know, your Libyan teachers, Iraqi scientists, Syrian doctors, they're really, really educated, very literate, very sort of egalitarian society. So they're not people who are necessarily, and also they've not been involved in any political violence. So let's be honest, these seven countries, there's not one citizen who's been to the United States or lives in the United States that ever committed an act of violence in the United States from the seven countries. So from a security perspective, it fails. From a, and also, like, it sends a message to say that this is America. We told you so. They hate Muslims. They can't stand you people. And it's a message to certain groups, for example, who say, you know, join us. And that's the, that's the concern that I have. And ultimately, uh, that is not a way that you protect countries and have security. Security based on what is proportionate, what is balanced and fair, and what, and what applies. And that's the rule of law. And just to, and virtually on this last point, and just to cheekily speak to the last the question in particular, um, there is a concern here that there are things being introduced back by the back door. I would argue that the British system is a very subtle system. So there's nothing of a, a, a pay court of us, but you have Schedule 7 here. It's been around for six to 17 years now. So you could be detained in an airport for up to six hours, have your DNA taken, have you, you, can't give a, you, can't, you have to give a comment, you can't say no comment, and you can't have a lawyer there. And yet, that's been going on for 17 years. And on average, 80,000 to 30,000 people a year are detained at airports and ports in the United Kingdom. No one speaks about it. And I think this is the problem, right? The overt stuff is happening out there. It's great that people are out there and saying things and challenging it. But there are problems here. And it's been going for a long time. Look at this, the data. It might not be based on religion because they don't make it public, but on race alone, it's disproportionately geared towards ethnic minorities. And what does that mean? So that's really important, I think. I think we should not, not lose sight of that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to yourself, Elaine, mm -hmm. um, obviously this segment we want to talk about some of the potential um, spin-offs from the so-called Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. So what are, you know, from a... From a political perspective, uh, what do you think might be some of the potential challenges coming our way? So I think it's that, so we're all looking at the Muslim ban, but this is part of a program from Trump, which is to uh, target this particular community. So as well as the Muslim ban, he's talked about having a Muslim register. Um, so I have heard stories from the States not long after Trump uh, went into office where um, a British woman of Bangladeshi ascent, a descent who lives in the States now went to renew her driver's licence and she was given it um, because of her, because she was originally from, uh, from Bangladesh and it's things like that, it's that which she just filled in and didn't think anything of it and that's the concerning thing is that they're also starting to do 
things like that where they, you know they keep a record of of who affiliates with particular groups and who is of a particular religion and we saw that in this country as well when the Tories proposed um, having businesses declare how many uh, foreign workers they had working for them and that's the dangerous thing is that it's the rhetoric then snowballs because one country gets away with it so then someone else tries it and so I think we have to constantly be on our guard mm. and you know, Donald Trump is currently in the most powerful office in the world. We're rolling over and acting like America's lapdog again. Um, France has elections this year where there's a very real threat that uh, Le Pen and the far right will get elected. Um, so I think the challenge for us is not being complacent. I think that's partly why Trump got elected, because we all sat there and went, it will be fine. It's not possible a man like that could ever get elected. And then we are where we are. And um, so it's being on our guard constantly for, for the, you know, the, the sneaky ways that, that they try and bring things in. Sure. Uh, Tiba, you had another question. Um, how do you think Trump's Muslim ban will affect Muslim women in particular? OK, can I um, ask? Elaine to answer that again, so we get a female <laughs> perspective. That's that okay? all right. Yeah, um, I think again, it uh, in so in the states, um, we've seen uh, Trump's view of women, but also Muslim women. When there was uh, the Democrat convention, and there was the parents of the murdered, uh, sorry, killed soldier, killed in action, um, and it was the father that got up and addressed the convention, and the mother stood next to him and didn't say anything. And Trump, a few days later, came out and said. Oh, well, she probably wasn't allowed to speak. And that's, I think, where, where this is going. It's, that's the kind of impact it will have. It's a cultural thing where he's banning Muslims. Um, there is no evidence for, you know, and for any reason for this ban for these seven countries. It's purely based on religion and culture. And so then him coming out and saying more things like that, I think, reinforces that rhetoric. And so it builds a perception of the community, which isn't true. And then I think that becomes more dangerous in terms of there isn't that understanding people feel that they're allowed to run around and um, telling muslim women to remove their hijabs um and that you know they they're not allowed to work and all of these kind of things mm. that are coming out of there and i think that's where it it's a real problem yeah uh Tiba, what's your what's your opinion on that um i think personally it just exacerbates um the gendered islamophobia that we already witnessed so on one side, we see Muslim women as be, you know, being seen as oppressed, and mm. but because you have this perception of Muslim women by non-Muslims uh, who are Islamophobic, um, then they're seen as the most vulnerable. So if you see, um, if you look at the statistics in um, Islamophobic incidents, actual hate crimes, that you know, um, sentiment that's been translated into physical violence against Muslims, you'll see that Muslim women, especially niqabis, uh, people who wear the full niqab and um, the hijab, they're the ones that are the most highly targeted. Mm. So I think um, rhetoric like Trump is perpetuating in policies such as a Muslim ban just makes situations like this worse for Muslim women. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mashrufa, do you have a question? Um, so we've all kind of talked about the, the flaws within the Muslim ban. Um, moving forward, how would you recommend and say that we keep this sustained conversation going uh, where we challenge this kind of divisive and Islamophobic sentiments? Okay, um, how do you think what do you think the uh, solution should be or the steps that we should be taking to try and uh, challenge this uh, narrative? Yeah, so um, I think the movements that we've seen across both the US and the UK has been phenom phenomenal in the sense that we are so united um, to challenge this. But I think in order to keep it going, we need to exercise our voice. You know, I think a lot of people think that politics is very much, you know, men in suits in Parliament. Um, but very much, you know, we can contact our local MPs, um, councillors, and exercise our voice in whether that's locally, regionally, nationally. Um, we just need to speak up. And I think a lot of the time, the Muslim community, um, similar to what Arib was saying, you know, we're told, you know, be careful, be careful about the future prospects. Um, but I think saying something uh, that is outright an injustice is there's nothing wrong and go with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I believe we've got a caller on the line. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, caller. Assalamu alaikum. Your mind is to the presenter so he can bring it up. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. brother, you are live. Uh, do you want to uh, share your question? Hello. Hi. How would you like to contribute? Okay, I think we've lost the caller, so I'm sure the caller will call back. Um, 
Arib, how would you respond to um, Ashrufa's uh, points? In terms of moving on and moving forward? Yeah. Um, in terms of pressure, so the previous point I was making, the best way, in my opinion, in terms of ensuring pressure is met and that awareness is is there is by talking about your stories and incidents that do take place, i.e. highlighting it, putting it on Facebook, um, talking to journalists, telling them this has happened. You'd be surprised at how um, um, receptive journalists are when it comes to these kind of stories because um, like Ibrahim was saying, I think in Britain we have this really interesting culture where we assume everything is fine, where we assume everyone is peaceful, everyone gets along. But the reality is this, it's not necessarily the case. We do. When you go out to cities, when you go out to remote parts of this country, you see you have sentiments that are very Islamophobic and it's not their own fault. It's maybe because of the fact that they've never met a Muslim and whatnot. And that's OK, you know, and, I, and people's minds can be changed. But in terms of moving forward, as the Muslim community has been good, as the Muslim community, I'll start off with that. Um, I think going back to, I think, Kausa, you, sp you gave that kind of Quranic verse and whatnot. And I think that's a fair point and whatnot. But then at the same time, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, talked about tying your camel. And um, I think this is one of tying a camel, where we talk about these issues, where we speak about them. And I think as Muslim men, we also have to bear in mind that Muslim women face the brunt of um, Islamophobia because they're visibly Muslim. We can sh shorten our beards, we can um, have slick back haircuts and whatnot, right? But um, for Muslim women, especially women who wear hijab or wear burqas and whatnot, they're, they're a target because they're visibly Muslim. And I think it's a responsibility of Muslim men to kind of be aware of that and acknowledge that. In terms of the Bengali community, I, one thing when I was in, in, in New York during the election period, one thing I noticed, especially within the Bengali community there, was um, the only thing that they were really concerned about was whether or not when they go back to Bangladesh, they'd be allowed back in. Now, that's great. But at the same time, um, from a Bengali perspective, we also have to bear in mind that for Bengali Muslims in particular, there are individuals who share the same faith as us. And there's something called solidarity, where you show support to people um, from different walks, different backgrounds and whatnot. If anything, as Bengalis, Pakistanis, whoever that may be, we should be showing support. And one thing that we've not really done much as a Bengali community, and I'm saying Bengali because it's a Bengali community channel, is because of the fact that is we've not really always shown support to our non-Bengali brethren. And I think that's something to kind of bear in mind in terms of moving forward, because that's what kind of ensures that we have a more harmonious and more um, prosperous society as well, when you show that solidarity and you show uh, that support. So awareness and also solidarity, those are the two things I'd encourage to okay. move forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Sarah, did you have another question? OK, no that's fine. All right, and Nida? Uh, last question, uh, I'm just trying to, okay, that's absolutely fine. Um, as we're coming towards the end of the show, um, I'll ask all our panel members to summarise, uh, but before you summarise, what I wanted to do was do a quick vote, okay? Um, so, you've heard, you know, everything, uh, all the discussions about the Muslim ban. Put up your hands if you would, if you would still like to go to America, despite all the challenges that you might face. Put up your hands if uh, that wouldn't put you off attempting to try and go to America. Okay, it's really interesting. Can I get, uh, if you keep your hands up, if you want to respond to why, despite knowing what you do, it would still uh, make you want to go. Yeah, Shufa? Um, so I'm, I'm a firm believer in the fact that we have a duty as Muslims to go out there and meet people. Um, I think a lot of the times we kind of isolate ourselves and we stay where we are more comfortable um, but going to America shouldn't st you know the Muslim ban should not stop us from going to America you know meeting people I think actions speak louder than words we know that um, another means of dawah is just to just be I think a lot of people just assume that you're gonna come to them with kind of religious rhetoric um, when they know that you watch the same TV shows you do the same things at them sure. We, we, no, we need to normalise Muslims and I think a lot of the time we're foreignized. Um, so I think this Muslim ban is more of an incentive for me to go to America if I were to be given the chance. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask our panel members just to say your uh, final words in summary um, of uh, how you think moving forward uh, we need to work together as a community? I would say a few things. Very quickly, I agree. I think if you actually look at the history of Islam, Islam only ever became what it was to take travel. 
right? Whether it be Indone Indonesian, um, Indonesian mercenary or the Ethiopian Christian king who gave uh, f uh, safety to Muslims who are fleeing from oppression. That's how Islam has always been a very international religion and very global. In terms of what we can do, I mean, uh, you know, and yourselves in particular, is don't stop what you're doing. Just carry on as you are, but be active. You have a voice. And in the world of today, whether it be social media or the pen or whatever, or, being, or advocating, you have a voice. And ultimately, uh, as Frederick Douglass said, who was a free slave, who was the first free slave to write a speech for an American inauguration, he said that, um, you know, that basically nothing is given unless you have a demand. And ultimately, you have to be demands. What do we want? What do we want the world to look like? What do we want the world to be like? We have to think about that and advocate for that and push for that. Because ultimately, you will not be given your rights. You have to work for your rights Thank and you. maintain what we have. Thank you, Ibrahim. Arib, your um, final words? So I, I, I've kind of said a lot, but I think in terms from a journalist perspective and also in terms of what the Muslim community can be doing, and is that the company? Yeah. One of the things I would encourage everyone back home to do and all the panelists here is if you if you hear of instances in terms of um, Islamophobia and whatnot, get in contact. Um, you can speak to me. I'm at Middle East I, at ARE underscore EB on Twitter. Um, and also not just in terms of Muslim ban, we're seeing Muslims being disproportionately impacted when it comes to um, policies and whatnot here in the UK in terms of policies like Prevent. Like Prevent is affecting so many um, Muslims across the country. But the fact of the matter is many Muslims are afraid to talk. But one of the reasons why the tide is shifting on Prevent, especially public opinion, is because more stories are coming forward, more people are talking about their experiences. So Arriba, get in we'll touch. To cut you off there. And finally, Elaine. Um, so I guess being a white, middle class British woman, I'm not going to lecture your community on what you should do. Um, but I think from my perspective, yeah. actually, I have a responsibility and people like me have a responsibility because I do have a position of privilege. That means I have access, a platform and things that, um, you know, that other people sure. don't. And so I think it's about using that platform to publicise those stories so that That's they right. um, get more coverage yeah. and to make sure that, you know, we're able to build links between, between different sure. communities. Thank you very much. Uh, we've run out of time. So I just want to say a huge thanks to our audience and also for our panel members who have come on the show. And thank you to you who have watched this and have contributed via email on social media. And do carry on that conversation. I think the key message here is uh, we need to challenge... Uh, the narrative and we need to make sure that we have our voices heard and uh, only then can we challenge uh, w uh, the way things are being run and be part of the solution as opposed to sit on the side and just criticize so thank you for watching and uh, inshallah uh, we'll see you very soon assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh